Not me. Well, welcome to uh, ADUs, the perfect housing solution. Um, and before we get our session started, you know we're always doing our membership spotlights. So this week, a huge congratulation to not one, but four Green Home Institute members who led a team to get this Lakeside Net Zero Passive House to achieve LEED Platinum version 4.1 certification on the Southwest Michigan home. It also achieved FIA Source Zero and HERS index rating of negative 10, resulting in an estimated $6,000 in yearly estimated cost savings as built, uh, verse built to code home. Uh, congrats to our member and architect certified passive house consultant, Mark A. Miller, Architects and Builders Incorporated, Abueva Builders, and the Raider team, Catalyst Partners and Eco Achievers. Now, two things really stood out to me on this project I wanted to point out. First is their use of the Mitsubishi ducted air source heat pump system, which heats and cools the entire home on electricity with less carbon, and Build Equinox Serve 2, which uses demand-controlled smart ventilation to keep occupants healthy in an energy-efficient way. Next is the biophilic design of the home, which has its shapes and patterns, natural views, and sunlight, bringing in a sense of warmth, joy, comfort, and beauty that we don't often see in many of today's homes. We will be doing a virtual tour of this project, so stay tuned. In the meantime, check out uh, more information on the Green Home Institute blog at the link listed here below. Now, you know this is who Green Home Institute members are. This is what Green Home Institute members do, and so can you go to our website and uh, sign up to learn more. Now, before we get started today, a huge thanks to all of our sponsors, especially our gold level sponsor, Sun Radon. Thanks to them and their support. Sun Radon has air quality sensors that communicate with you and your clients to determine if a home's air is healthy, both including radon and mold risk. Easy color displays show if there's an issue and data is tracked over time to determine persistent air quality problems. Multifamily and housing developers can track multiple properties and units to ensure tenants' health and satisfaction. Green home inspectors can use their advanced radon uh, uh, systems to detect radon right in the field, uh, similar to a home inspection process. Learn more at sunradon.com shop about all of these different devices. All right, well, welcome everyone to ADUs. Again, the perfect housing uh, solution. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Uh, we're a small but mighty team. I am uh, going to be your moderator today. My name is Brett Little, the education manager here. As always, uh, this course is approved uh, for multiple continuing education units, including all five pillars of green in our certified green home professional designation. AIA health, welfare, and safety may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license, and our new uh, CU uh, with our friends over at SARA. Um, so I am super excited to have uh, our speaker here today, our main speaker, Sherry Coons. Sherry, uh, this is now your third, fourth time maybe on the show, so it's always great to have you back and to be talking about uh, your new book that is coming out, ADUs, The Perfect Housing Solution, um, as always. And so you've got some special guest speakers that you've featured projects in the books, uh, Tessa Bradley and Jamie Wolf, who are also joining us today. And we're doing a giveaway to a Green Home Institute member uh, who joins us live today for this book. So always excited to have you here, Sherry. Thanks for joining us. Um, please go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Brad. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And I am really delighted today to have Tessa Bradley from Artisans Group and um, Jamie Wolf, um, because I've known both of them for quite a while and have had several of their projects. And I asked them to join me today because they are both so knowledgeable and they build really wonderful houses, really intelligent well-designed, um, energy-efficient houses, which, you know, is very important to me. So I'm very excited to be here again. To, yesterday, my book came out, which is like giving birth. And uh, after nine months or a year of working hard, I'm delighted to see the results of this. Um, I think that ADUs are such an important topic. And so I'm really happy for us to be talking about that today. I would like both Tessa and Jamie to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. 
Uh, Tessa? Hello? Sorry. I was uh, uh, waiting for Jamie, my bad. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Tessa Bradley, and I'm a principal architect at the Artisans Group. We're a 100% women-owned architecture and planning company. We were an early adopter of Passive House, and so our firm is focused on that. Um, and we've been in, in uh, doing that kind of work for over a decade now. So we have um, extensive experience in that very innovative, sustainable kind of projects. And we work extensively with our local Habitat for Humanities for affordable housing, as well as commercial work, public work, uh, as well as high-end residential. So I am Jamie Wolf. Uh, I'm recently retired from my company, Wolf Works, which is a design build company in Avon, Connecticut. It is now a worker owned company, uh, both minority and women owned company. And like Tessa, early adopter of Passive House, built the first certified Passive House here in Connecticut. Um, and most of my career has been in remodeling. Um, and for the past 15 years or so, we've been doing new homes really since Passive House. Um, so um, excited to be here and talk about ADUs. Okay, so I just wanted to, I know this is a very knowledgeable group, so I want to um, go fairly quickly um, to uh, talk about um, ADUs and what they are. Uh, a lot of people are still not familiar with ADUs. Um, and so just briefly, they are either connected to the main house, they're above the garage, they're a separate unit, and they all have sanitary facilities, kitchens, and sleeping areas. People are also always asking me, what are people using ADUs for? And so there are really multiple reasons. And as a matter of fact, in the book that I have coming out, there's um, a multitude of different um, concepts that people built them for. Um, for one thing is they provide housing for elderly relatives, which is a really great thing. And in some cases, elderly uh, people are using them for their uh, care helpers that they might have in the future. Um, they provide housing for their adult children. Um, they offer an opportunity to add income by leasing the space out for long term or short term. And then of course, it matters where you live. So um, the options are, are always different in different locations. Um, and both of my guests can both uh, talk about um, their uh, restrictions in their areas. Um, they add extra space for office, uh, for visiting relatives, for entertainment area. In the book, I have one uh, family who, uh, he's an actor and he, um, she's an actor and she's using it to practice her lines and her husband works from home. And since they have a small house, this really is a great place for, for them to um, to use for their extra activities. And it's also part of a, a retirement plan. For some people, they're just using this um, to, when they want to retire, they're moving into the ADU and they're giving the main house to their, to their um, uh, renters. So I wanted to show you some examples. This is really- um, Sherry, yeah. real quick, can we get your slide share on right now? It's not currently on. It's not on. Looking at now is a wonderful project. This project is quite small. Um, these people, this is actually the builder from um, in Denver, Simple Homes, and he built this because his house was not very big. He just had a baby and his in-laws come for extended periods of time. So he, it's amazing what he's done with 350 square feet. I mean, the living area is very expansive. He has skylights and um, lots of light coming in and um, a full kitchen and a very comfortable bedroom and uh, also a bathroom. Um, uh, okay, here's another project that was done uh, over the garage. Actually, this how this garage burned down. And when he rebuilt the garage, the family decided to put in um, an ADU above it. And interesting, they are using this for a parent who is handicapped and will not be able to uh, 
um, uh, access the steps. And so they put an elevator in the garage. And many of the features of this house are very um, universally designed. And so they're very accessible. And I think it's really an attractive project. And these people decided they wanted everything to be top notch and quality over quantity. Um, I'm going quickly because I know time is of the essence. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. This was a family that was looking for a land that they could build an ADU. And if you can see on the bottom, it had a log cabin on it and they had a, they had a, a, a square space to put an ADU and they decided to use a kit home and it, it just fits really beautifully. They plan when their kids go off to school to actually live there and to rent out the main house. And there's a lot of really uh, 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 space saving uh, aspects here. They put the spiral staircase, which takes up a lot less space than another uh, a regular staircase would. Um, this is a, a wonderful project also in Connecticut, and it was built by uh, Unity Homes. And this originally was uh, a Zoom house, which is one of their main houses that they build. It's a panelized house. And the people wanted, they loved this design and wanted it as an ADU, so they, um, they redesigned it uh, to be smaller. And now they call it a Zoomette. And the owners are going to rent out the main house and they're going to live in this house on the project. And it's um, really, a again, a very lovely project and really a, a full house where somebody could comfortably live uh, for, you know, full time. Um, another terrific house that's um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, most a lot of towns, I won't say most, but a lot of towns will not allow people to rent both the main house, the primary house, and the ADU. But in Atlanta, they do. There's a housing shortage, and um, they do allow people to uh, rent out both projects. And in this case, it was a restaurateur. They, they retired, and building houses and renting them out was their main source of income. And they discovered that they could... Uh, maximize their income by putting ADUs. So they put two ADUs on three of the projects and um, they're a little more traditional. They have nice porches and um, like all of these houses that I'm showing you are quite energy efficient. Another interesting house in Austin um, is uh, this 996 square foot house. And again, it was uh, done as a rental space. And it's a young guy who actually was looking for a house that had property so that he could put the, an ADU on and, and have it make offering money. And uh, like a lot of the houses that are in this book, there are barrier-free showers. And a lot of people are doing that so that um, it is... Uh, feasible for people that um, have special needs as well as themselves if someday they want to move in and they're elderly. So I think this is a really beautiful example of an uh, attractive one in Texas. Um, and here we come to Tess's ADU in Olympia, um, which is 400 square feet. And I think that right now this person, rather than rent out space to do her business, she decided that this was a much more practical means of doing that. And I think that um, it's uh, kind of flexible. Right now it's being used as an office. And I think at some point she's going to rent it out or use it as a guest house. Um, Tessa, do you want to say something about this house, this ADU? Uh, I will. I, um, I think what's special about this project is actually it's it's modesty. This is a part of a program that we help pilot with our local cities, Olympia, Tumwater, and Lacey, where uh, we designed four ADU models for them that are pre-approved plan sets that they will give to people for free whose uh, properties can support the addition of an ADU. So uh, we were trying to make density and ADUs a lot more accessible than 
hiring an architect. Um, and although I won't apologize for the amount of glass and beautiful structures on our website, I think this one is, is interesting due to the modesty and due to the um, program from which it comes. Mm -hmm. And here is the interior of that house. So right now it does not have a bed, but I know that they are planning to put in a Murphy bed um, and make it more of a, uh, um, a residence rather than as a workspace. Anything you wanted to add, Tessa? No, I think you captured it beautifully. Okay, very good. So this is a really interesting project to me. This was a very traditional house. You can see on the left that it had a breezeway and they decided that um, this having an ADU would really help them for their retirement. And so they decided to uh, close up the breezeway and make it an ADU. And it's really interesting because uh, neighbors pass by and they say they can hardly remember when it looked like the house on the left that because it so beautifully works with um, the way they designed the exterior. Um, and again, this house was done so in, in such an interesting way. The kitchen is a full kitchen and it has everything but in smaller, so all the appliances are smaller size. They have an induction stove um, with two burners. And again, these people, were, even though they had a very small space, they wanted to make it, they wanted to put the money into quality rather than quantity. And so um, the uh, ADU is very energy efficient. And as you can see, it's very bright and very well done for the small space that they had. And here we come to the uh, ADU that Jamie built. And this is a particularly interesting project because it's a multi-generational house. It was not an add-on. It was well thought out. Um, the parents and the uh, adult children um, planned this together and both parts of the house were designed to meet their own specifications. And in between is a, um, a porch where they can meet or not meet if they don't want to. And um, it's really a great example of um, what people can do. A lot of older people today do not want to live in senior facilities. And this is really an ideal situation. The, the adults, the uh, parents travel a great deal and the, uh, the uh, children can watch the house. They can also, they have a built-in babysitter and they, they specified that they really like each other and so they can spend time together. And at some point, if the parents need help, the, the, um, the uh, adult children are there. And I want Jamie to uh, jump in and tell us a little bit about this. Uh, this uh, as you can see, this is in Avon, Connecticut. Well, I, I would just like to build on something you said earlier, Sherry, about quality over quantity of space, which is something Sarah Suzanka brought up a couple decades ago. Um, mm -hmm. It really is at play in ADUs. And I think in every project in your book, you can see how with less space, you're kind of called on to uh, emphasize specific design features and maybe lavish a little more quality or design attention on them. So, and because you don't have a whole house to, to spend a lot of money on craft on, you can spend less on fewer features, but they really sing. And again, not just this project, but every project in your book, I think you can find a little bit of that. Um, oh, well, thank you, Jamie. And I think I looked at about two or 300 ADUs before I chose the ones for this book. And I think that all of the ones in my book are just great examples and inspiration for people, anybody that wants to build an ADU of what they can do and what they can achieve with very good design and with a lot of forethought. Um, and I wanted to show this uh, porch, which is just so charming between the house and the um, and the ADU. And um, the picture on the right is the ADU and it shows um, the office space that they use upstairs of the ADU and where the grandchildren can play. And it's just a wonderful uh, opportunity for um, grandparents to spend time with children. 
I think I'll, I'll, make, I'll make just one comment about that, Sherry. Um, this is a little larger ADU in part because of this loft space. And the loft space is presently acts as an office and as you show, a place where their grandchild can come play. Um, but in the future, if they needed care, um, it could be a place where a caregiver could live in the space. So it was consciously, yeah. and, and a guest could visit. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, so a lot of these um, ADUs are designed uh, to be very flexible so that they can be good for their guests, but also for themselves and also for themselves if they get older and they uh, need help or they need it to be more accessible. Um, this is another fabulous project. This is in Washington, D.C. And this was an interesting project because the main house, behind the main house was a heritage tree and it had deep roots and it was very important for them to be able to um, not disturb the, the tree in any way. And so um, they wanted to build an ADU for um, the, the family's father. And so they built this bridge across between the ADU and the house. And it was really well thought out and um, really a beautiful project and a beautiful quality project. And you can see the middle, um, the middle photograph, you can see that they put one entry into the ADU that would be accessible for anybody that had um, uh, uh, disabilities. Um, uh, there's also entrances through the bridge and, um, and there's another one also uh, on the side, which you can't see, but um, they want, they really thought of everything in making this a, a great project for, um, for their father and, and also perhaps for some future other use. Um, and another really interesting project, this was a tough shed, which you can see on the left. And the family decided they wanted to put in an ADU. And so rather than taking down the tough shed, they decided to just convert it to a, an ADU. And you can see on the right, it's really such a charming project in Portland. Um, and the inside is just lovely. They um, used a lot of what was there and just um, painted it and, um, and subdivided it, of course, and has a full kitchen. And, and um, also, you could see on the bottom right, they, they wanted to have an outdoor space. As many of the um, ADU designers, they wanted to make sure that they created an outdoor space because that's one of the advantages of having an ADU uh, so that people uh, can enjoy the outside as well as being inside. And so there was a very small area there, but they managed to put a little, uh, a little uh, eating area and sitting area outside. Um, another very interesting project, this is in Toronto, in Canada, where a lot of these ADUs really began. Um, they have laneway houses. Um, there's lanes that run parallel to the main street and where most of the garages uh, are so that the garages are not accessible through the main street. And what the, a lot of what people are doing is converting those to what they call laneway houses, which is the same thing as an ADU. And in this case, the, the husband is, um, of the owner is a photographer and uh, an architect and his wife is a photographer. And so they made the lower level of the ADU, their office and the above area, they, they rent out. And they said at some point they might decide to rent out their main house, which you can see behind the ADU, or um, they might just make it a multi-generational compound with family living um, and in both the top and the bottom areas of this laneway and the house. So a very interesting project. Um, <coughs> excuse me. On the top right, you can see the office space that they use, and it's very flexible. Everything in that office can be moved around. And then you can see the um, ADU, the living space at the top, and they just put a punch of color in. And again, one of the things that uh, people are doing to make it be successful is to have a good deal of lighting. 
and incidentally, that project had two doors so that one for the AG, the AGU above and uh, the workspace below. And these are some of the things that make the AGU feel bigger than they are. And there were um, lots of different concepts that people used. Um, lots of storage space was important, lots of light. Um, several people used hanging toilets, which um, use less space in the bathroom and also barrier free showers. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> the spiral stair staircase that I showed you a minute ago. And so that you know, the, the ADU is now available and uh, just came out yesterday. And I'm very pleased to um, be able to share some of this with you. I'd like to give um, my guests an opportunity to talk a little bit about their experience building ADUs and, and the efficiencies that they built in. And I hope we have some time for questions. Tessa? Hello? Yes. Yes, sir. Sure. <laughs> Hi. Would you like to um, talk a little bit about ADUs in, um, in Washington State? Sure. Um, I was actually just answering a question, and I'm not, uh, you know, via the messaging system. I'm not sure if those are public or not, but um, folks were, were sort of touting the the policies that Washington State has at a at a state level, uh, which are which have um, become much more uh, useful to ADUs in the past few years. Now we're seeing a trickle down effect uh, in that some cities are embracing the density and the vision for accessible housing and and having lots of different kinds of housing, and then some cities are sort of creating um, you know, codes that will keep ADUs from being able to be a possibility within their city limits. So mm -hmm. seeing sort of uh, multiple responses to sort of that, uh, you know, state level mandate about density and about the development of uh, diverse housing. So mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting climate. Oh, yeah, terrific. T Tessa, I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of these questions. And of course, a lot of this is hyper local, right? As you point out, some are pushing back, some are embracing it. What would you say to our audience here on what is the motivation factor that they can engage their local municipalities to get them to see the benefits? What is, you know, what is it that motivates that? What are you seeing out there? So, you know, I think that um, city councils are always a really good place to start, um, you know, to be an active civic person. Uh, I think that they're challenging and interesting because oftentimes uh, people don't have any exposure into, you know, urban planning or city planning or architecture or anything like that. Um, you know, they might just, you know, be a dentist and then they become a city council person. So, you know, um, it, you know, it's you oftentimes have visioning from people that don't have a full picture. Uh, so I think, you know, committing to the education of some of those those people that are visioning for the city can be a really good move. Um, and I think empathy is a really good path for that. Yeah. You know, in Olympia, uh, we we have, you know, a fascinating climate of support and non-support for density. Um, there, there's like a strong contingent that wants the city to stay exactly the same as when they bought, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so that's kind of a, um, a situation we see. And then there's uh, people that can appreciate that, um, you know, if you bought 10 years ago, uh, you couldn't buy now. And so I think that empathy is is a really good way to start to work on um, some of these, the density of the cities. And, you know, the cities know they need to be more dense. Most cities have traffic problems and people driving in from um, suburban areas. Um, most amenities that get like communities excited, let's say you have a little coffee shop go in or something that's walkable in a community. That's oftentimes what people love about urban centers, right? Portland, Seattle, is that they can walk and get a slice of pizza and um, not have to not have to drive to do it. And those amenities are really only supported by rooftops. Mm -hmm. And so if we want nice things, this is how we get nice things. We must have mm -hmm. density, uh, mm -hmm. not to mention all of the families that need housing and don't have options available to them. I wanted to also mention that one of the um, issues in a lot of cities is that if they don't allow ADUs, then what they're going to get is multiplexes, which is something that we're getting in uh, where I live in Connecticut. Um, 
<clears throat> a lot of the people are resistant to having ADUs. And so as a result, there's several multiplexes that are going up. They're quite expensive. They're out of reach for a lot of the residents that live here. And they are they change the nature of the way the town looks, the charm of the town. <clears throat> Whereas if they had an ADU, it would be behind the house, you don't see it, and it really maintains the charm and the look of the town without having to build a lot of large structures. I think it's worth saying here that the elephant in the room here is zoning. Um, and we have two things. We have how we make beautiful ADUs, which is certainly what Sherry's showcasing in her book. And Tess and I spend our days, or I did, uh, um, <laughs> dreaming up and creating and making beautiful. But really, the, the part that Tess is talking about is the need for zoning, which is an expression of policy. And, and most towns are, and cities are required to update their plans for their city and their zoning every 10 years. So there's an opportunity there, especially when that takes place, to show up and express support for this. Um, and I think that um, I want to share a little bit in, in Connecticut, um, uh, a movement started called Desegregate Connecticut that took a hard look at zoning requirements and, and did made basically made an atlas showing zoning and where single family is allowed and where different things are allowed. The woman who started that, Sarah Bronin, has now taken that national with the zoning atlas so that mm -hmm. she wants to make everyone able to see what the zoning is, where they live. Um, and then be able to advocate for the opportunity. The other piece of this I wanted to speak to is that at least every colleague, professional colleague I know, be it an architect or a builder, really feels that thing that Tessa said, that we need to provide housing for people who it is out of reach for now. There's a concept called the missing middle, um, and ADUs are a key part of addressing the shortage of that. And with that is the fact that single family housing is not serving the way households are anymore. That the, the nuclear family is the minority family in the United States, and it will increasingly be houses without children and often without even married partners. So all these trends are, are leading towards ADUs as one of the solutions to that. Right. Yeah, yeah, Jamie, and it's it's a really interesting topic because zoning very quickly becomes about class and race. Um, and so, you know, we have very um, long held racist roots in this country that that are very much supported by zoning. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's it very much becomes a um, a question of civil of civil rights um, very quickly when you start to examine it, which I think is is a really fascinating piece of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Jamie, I appreciated you bringing up that zoning atlas. So I was looking it up as you were talking, and I posted in the chat www.zoningatlas.org, uh, I believe, is what you were referencing. So pretty interesting if folks want to check that out. So, okay. Um, do we have any questions that you would like to address? Well, there's a lot of technical. I can't one go by. I can't that one. Well, that there's a lot of technical questions in there. Um, and one of the first ones I'm going to go back to our member uh, who, who asked way at the beginning is sort of that interconnection uh, with the water and sewer lines and what the challenges are there. I'm sure it's different in every city, but just speak generally to, you know, what that might entail. Jamie, do you want me to go ahead or? Yeah, you can take that. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, at least with our, our sort of pilot program where you're trying to get a pre-approved free ADU, um, sort of the first step is to go in and talk to the city mm -hmm. about uh, the, the sewer and water. So sort of the first utilities we have to figure out. Um, every city, the three cities we're working with uh, are, they all have um, different um, codes around whether you have to run a new water line or whether you can um, tap into the water line that's running the house. Same with the mm -hmm. sewer. They, they are all different. So mm -hmm. each one you have to kind of figure out. And, and some of them you know, have more costly, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can't run, you can't have a uh, tap into the sewer of the house. You have to run a separate sewer. And so there, there are some 
you know, not so great codes that maybe don't make sense um, that are just, you know, lingering in the in the code, uh, unfortunately. I think it's important to point out too that this is uh, owned as a single thing that you can't sell the ADU generally in my understanding of most EDUs, that they're part, they're a single parcel of property. The other piece that's challenging uh, is impact fees. Uh, so, you know, these these little houses do incur, in, in our case, very hefty impact fees, you know, Seattle, Olympia, places like that. I, I think we're around 15 or 20 grand in impact fees, and that's before we've done anything, right? Just, just, uh, just paying to build the building, which of course, you know, a lot of those fees go to really good things like schools and infrastructure, but um, it can be a, um, you know, a barrier to the project. Is that a unique fee or you're talking about like, that's a normal fee someone has to pay to build a normal home and you get that? So as well. impact fees in our area are more like 30 grand for a full house. For an ADU, they're more like 15 or 20. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know what they're like in other, other states per se. Okay. Yeah, somebody was mentioning... Um, in one of the questions, polling permits and having to pay those fees. It's, it sounds like in some cases you're seeing that's part of that and maybe it's cheaper for ADUs, maybe not. Yeah. Um, well, and, and continuing on with sort of the infrastructural items. Uh, so yeah, the question that kind of came up is the struggle with MEPs, you know, in these, um, I don't want to say smaller, uh, but right-sized, like that turn, like, because hopefully that's designed appropriately, so it has that right-sized appeal. But it, it can be a struggle. So what are some of the suggestions on the MEP approach for this, these types of projects? Go ahead, Jamie, I'll follow up after you. Okay, I was just posting something I had in my notes from the the principal, Sarah Suzanka, um, advocates just apply so beautifully to ADUs. Um, mechanicals, um, well, of course, this is cl a climate question too. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So here in the Northeast, we're certainly, well, I, I think to go back to energy efficiency, we're always trying to have as low a load as possible. Mm -hmm. So the lower the load is, the simpler and smaller the equipment can be. These are such small volumes of space that I, I would guess just about every ADU is using mini splits. Um, and, um, you know, the one we did is a net zero one. It's all electric. Um, I think aspirationally, that's where we all want to go. Um, they have balanced ventilation uh, because they're built airtight to, to keep that low really low. Um, but it's, it's smaller, simpler equipment. It's not, um, it can be complex in a larger home to work out mechanical systems. Um, the scale of these homes make the mechanicals fairly easy. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were getting at, Brett? I think most of the people also are trying to, um, insulate their houses really well so that they use a minimum mm. of energy and some of them have solar panels and um, some people actually put solar panels on the adu that they could use with the main house and somebody had asked me if, if these are more energy efficient or less than the main house and um, as particularly in some areas of the country the um, requirements have have increased for efficiency. And so a lot of people have told me that their ADUs were more efficient than their main house because they had to meet higher standards. We, when we did our plan sets for our pilot program, <laughs> we, we baked in a lot of passive house building science into that. Um, so we did, you know, improved, um, you know, uh, thermally broken wall assemblies and we recommended, um, you know, flange set triple pane windows. And, you know, we make a lot of recommendations in the set that people can, can choose to do or not. Um, but we're also doing full passive house ADUs, um, you know, custom ones for people. Uh, so, you know, we're finding that those are incredibly efficient. Um, and just to support kind of what Jamie said, we are seeing, you know, that most small structures, if they're energy efficient, and in our case, they are, uh, we're using usually a mix of mini splits, um, sometimes, you know, small, um, you know, sand ins for the water heaters is really common. Um, and then, uh, so we have a, uh, we've used a small HRV on some of our ADUs called the Lunos, mm -hmm. which you have two mm -hmm. units, one goes in separate areas of the house and they, they oscillate. 
um, mm -hmm. to, to provide balanced ventilation for the projects. Um, and so those are kind of um, similar but different systems to how we, we use mm -hmm. in a larger structure. Uh, but we are are achieving a lot of really high performance with with that approach. Yeah. Now, you Tessie, you mentioned passive house, and I was just even thinking some of these uh, stronger codes that are coming out. Right? They have these R value requirements that require thicker insulation or better air sealing, especially passive house. And of course, when you're talking about these more right sized units or attachments, you're sometimes just very limited on space to get insulation that thick. And also if, if anyone understands how air leakage works, you're always penalized when you build smaller, right? You right. always, it, the ACH always is against you when you build bigger, it's for you. So how do you reconcile that with, you know, the stronger energy codes? Now, clearly building more right size, just scientifically, we have less volume to heat and cool. So you win that way. But usually the codes don't look at it that way. And I don't think Passive House does maybe, but could you maybe speak to that a little bit? So, you know, I we we are very entrenched in Passive House and we love FIAS, our certifying entity, and we certify a lot of our work, mm -hmm. but we're also um, hyper pragmatic. Like we know why we're doing the work that we're doing and it's to put better structures on the planet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't, I would not say that we've certified a lot of our ADUs yet. Um, they're really, really small and passive house is an energy allowance per square foot, right? Per year. So, mm -hmm. um, so you are kind of penalized for a small house, even though your overall usage will be smaller. I, mm -hmm. I personally resolve, um, uh, the challenges of the approach with using the science that we're using on larger structures that we are certifying. I am using the same science on these smaller structures. Mm -hmm. And so even though, you know, I'm being penalized for a tiny structure. I know for a fact that I was already using one tenth the energy on my big house. So now I'm using half that on my little house. Um, you know, so uh, we don't certify everything. We do apply, um, you know, our massive experience in in high performance building to every project. Um, and, and I think to a degree, like there's the last 10% sometimes on a project to get to certification can get kind of silly. You know, like you have R70 in the roof, but to certify, I need R100. And there is an element of diminishing returns to some of the building science in what we do. Um, and so uh, I don't, I know that's not an exact answer, but subjectively, we try to, to, to not be assholes. We try to, we try to have, <laughs> have like reasonable expectations and execute right. them in a pragmatic and rational way. Yeah. No, that's great. I appreciate that insight. And, and, um, and we call that the sort of right the almost passive house approach right <laughs> aim for it try to get there as high as you can and and sometimes you get so close and and there's always fallback so jamie i know you said you're involved in in, in lately in the passive house as you've done more with new construction what do you i mean what do you have to add to that comment i i really like what tessa said the science doesn't care whether it's a <laughs> passive house or not um i kind of fall on that side i'm i'm uh i learned passive house early did certify passive house but increasingly, we stopped certifying projects because what we cared about was the performance less than certification. Um, but I think it's also important to say here or recognize if you look at these, you go, well, this is an apartment. It basically, these are apartment scale. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a bedroom, a, you know, and the difference is, and, and it would be much more efficient to build an apartment in an apartment building energy efficient wise. Um, and Passive House has been very effective working at that scale. Um, what makes these different is it's an apartment next to a house. That's what an ATU is. Um, and with that, unless you attach it to the house or if it's literally inside the house, you're gonna pay those energy penalties for a small building and service to volume ratio and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, the science is still the science. Um, and I guess the thing that I always, we do workshops on this, I always try to impress on people is you only get one chance to bake this in. Mm -hmm. um, you, you you know, insulate a slab, you can't come back and do that later. Mm -hmm. um, so you always have a responsibility, in my view, to build the most efficient shell as possible. The beauty too here is these are simple buildings. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have complex geometries generally. Um, so achieving high performance 
relative to all the things that were just mentioned, um, is just to be a given when you're building this way. And one of the really lovely things about building an ADU is that you already own the property. And one of the most expensive things when you go to build a house or buy a house is the property. And in this case, I want to say it's free. <laughs> you own the property and, and it just maximizes your investment. And what nobody has mentioned yet, but um, from my research, people told me that the ADUs are adding about 15% to the value of the house. So I mm. think it is a real win-win situation for homeowners. And it's great, like you said, for that middle range of people that really just can't afford to, to live by a new house. People are downsizing. And if they're downsizing, they can't afford to buy another house because the houses are just too expensive. So this is an opportunity. If their kids buy a house, they can live on the same property and, and, and really well, just maximize their investment. And you can think creatively about these things too. Would it be okay if I shared my screen, Brett? I have a project up that. Please, please do, yes. Okay. Um, so this is my co-principal's house um, who I own my architecture firm with. And she's another licensed architect and a CPHB like, my, uh, like myself, Rusa Cassell. So this is her home. Um, and she built it in front of a 600 square foot house that had been in her home for over a decade. Uh, that she then converted the original home into an ADU. So let me see if I can find a shot of it. But this is the, the certified passive house she built. Um, it was prefabbed, um, but it's, I don't think I have an overall shot. I thought I did. Um, but this, this home is built in front of a tiny home that you could, so she then converted that to an ADU. So when you're working with the cities, you can oftentimes get creative about, you know, how what which one is the ADU and how does that even work? It's even flexible in some in some arenas. So, you know, creative problem solving can go a long way um, with with the density question as well. One thing I want to bring up is that um, I'd say starting maybe four or five years ago, definitely around COVID too. Almost every client who comes to us either explicitly says or wants to plan for the future care of a parent. Um, I've been doing this a very long time, and it's noticeable to me how often people bring this up. Whether it's an immediate need, they're planning a home, a remodel, they're thinking about this. That's new, and it's really important part of this. Yeah, and I think that's just like a... That's a zeitgeist, right? It's a social response to the relegated elderly in our in our country. You know, we don't we don't like the way that we're caring for our elderly, and so um, you know, I think this is a fantastic solution. Yeah, yeah, and I was wondering, uh, you know, in that regards, how much you're seeing accessibility built into these homes. We have a program here called Zero Step, where the basic concept is there's no step, right? Steps are a huge impediment to people of all walks of life. Uh, quite mm -hmm. frankly, they can be a danger to anybody at any time. But more than that, it's of course, just being able to get around and access the home and smart technology. You know, how are you seeing that get implemented in those types of homes? I would say that at least half of the houses that the ADUs that are in the book have uh, some ac accountability to avail to accessibility. And so a lot of the houses, um, as I mentioned, they have barrier-free showers, they have more accessible kitchens, um, they have easy entries. Um, and so all of that I think is planned into a good many of them. Even if they don't have elderly parents, they're thinking they may be elderly at some point and want to live in the ADU. And so people are being very flexible about these ADUs and making them uh, a possible for rental now and maybe for themselves later. Now, now some questions were coming up on cost, uh, which I know is such a moving target depending on where you are and what you're trying to achieve. But could you all speak at a kind of a high level of costs? Um, and I especially assume there's a trade-off of building something new versus you know, renovating a garage or a basement. Um, can you just speak to that a little bit? 
Well, I can depress everyone with how much it costs to build here, and then maybe someone else can cheer up the group. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you know, we we see around three to four hundred dollars as a starting point for for cost per square foot of construction. Um, I think the home that uh, was in Sherry's book was actually really inexpensive compared to what we've seen in the past few years. Uh, I think it was built for around 150, maybe $175,000, which I haven't seen anything like that in probably six years. So I think they hired, you know, a small contractor who just had himself and not a lot of overhead and they kept their selections modest um, and the structure simple. And, uh, but, you know, I'm seeing ADUs cost more like $300,000 as a really a starting point, you know, they're tiny houses and it's hard, it's hard to build um, cost effectively where I live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to note that um, while they're much smaller, which if you if we're going to just use cost per square foot, would you go, oh, build it smaller, I'll save money. But they also have to have the things that are expensive in houses, kitchens and bathrooms and mechanical systems. And you can't spread the cost of those out, out over a lot more square feet. So cost per square feet what can be a confusing way to think about this. I think mostly um, to make them affordable, certainly keep them smaller, keep them simple, um, use materials wisely, um, but don't be afraid to spend a little extra on a small area of square footage. That's what I brought, brought up earlier. Every project, I see that in every project in Sherry's book, there's some little place that they just went for a little bit a while. And I don't think it cost them a lot of money to do that because there's just less square footage to need to do to spend that on. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question that was posted about um, financing and ownership. Uh, I think that's a pretty intriguing topic. Uh, I, I don't have all the answers, but I do know that, you know, if, let's say, um, you know, person A owns the property, but person B wants to own the ADU, let's say, um, that there, are, there is a condo, you can do condos if you don't live in Washington state. Um, you can do a land lease model where you own the building, but you lease the land that it sits on. And this is becoming a really common model for um, progressive Habitat for Humanities and other um, housing entities. Uh, so you can look into that as well, but there are there are um, legal mechanisms to move forward ownership, complex ownership, uh, if that's um, important to the success of the project. I think that in most areas of the country, um, there are exceptions like Atlanta, which I showed you. Um, in most areas, they want one of the houses, either the primary house or the ADU to be occupied by the owner. So. Um, I know that uh, the um, codes are changing and the restrictions are changing, but that seems to be more common than allowing uh, both places to be rented. And also, um, in most places, when you sell your primary house, the ADU must be sold with it, and it's not independent of the, of the primary house. But again, there are exceptions to that rule, depending on the location. Well, um, well there... we we are uh, now at our time. So um, yeah, before we uh, wrap up, I just want to quick uh, remind everybody that uh, this session is being recorded. Um, and so you can rewatch it on our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be there in the next couple of days, or you can click subscribe and it will be sent to you when it is available. Um, for those of you watching this here today, live right now, uh, or I'm sorry, for those of you watching in this in the future, head and take your quiz with an 80% passing rate, you'll receive your continuing ed. For those of you here live today, as long as you've been here the whole time and you're properly logged in, you'll receive your certificate from gutenbergcerts.com and check your spam for that over the next couple of days. Um, and before we wrap up, a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, our executive director, Jose, Reina, and all of our sponsors, including our top tier sponsors, uh, Mitsubishi and Ream, uh, who are helping folks decarbonize and hit a zero energy passive house targets uh, as they like. So um, before we uh, wrap up, everyone, just can we uh, uh, remind everybody where they can go to reach out to you, contact you for more information? Uh, Jamie, how about I start with you? 
Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'm retired. Or, so. <laughs> or your, your organization, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, you you would go to our website, yeah. um, which is homesthatfit.com. Okay. So like shoes that fit, homes that fit, kind of appropriate to the topic. Great, thank you. And how about you, uh, Tessa? Uh, you can find our website at artisansgroup.com. We're yeah. based out of Olympia, Washington. <laughs> we have a lot of beautiful projects in our portfolio. You can contact us through our website. Great. And uh, Sherry, where can people go to learn more about you and all the great books you have that we've talked about and the current one that's coming out? So I have a website. It's sherrykunis.com. And all of my books are actually profiled on um, Barnes and Noble and Amazon. And my books are available in uh, many small bookstores around the country. And so um, you can take a look at it. And in, um, on Amazon, I believe you can look into the book and see some of the pages. So you can see what the book looks like. But um, I just want to thank you, Brad, for inviting us all. I think it's been a really interesting session. And I'm so pleased to have Tessa and Jamie with me, who are both wonderful builders and um, architects and, um, and so knowledgeable. So I just thank you again. Thanks for yeah. reading us your book, Sherry. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all your help. All right. Well, Tessa, Jamie, wonderful to have you, Sherry. It's always great to have you on. I'm sure we'll have you on next year for the next one, right? <laughs> we'll have you back out. 80 use the perfect housing solution. It's out now. Go pick it up a copy and let's go out there and help make homes better and change where we can. So thank you all. Have a wonderful week. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye. Okay, are we 